where soaring granite peaks, waterfalls among the world's tallest, sweeping meadows, and gigantic sequoias conspire to create a beauty beyond belief. Join us as we head skyward with rock chocks, glide through the valley, seek out the places where the deer, the bear, and the bear patrol roam. No bear on scene and damage to three vehicles. And recharge at the Queen of Lodges. In a legendary landscape, we'll explore all the wonders of Yosemite, America's treasure. The first visitors might have wondered if they were dreaming. Set amid Northern California Sierra Nevada, Yosemite National Park reigns supreme. On the horizon, Mount Hoffman is the geographic center of the 750,000 acre area. Yet one valley, hailed as the incomparable valley, is so celebrated that many think it is Yosemite. Although Yosemite Valley is only 5% of the park, it's where 95% of the visitors go. Yosemite Valley itself is only one mile wide and seven miles long. However, Yosemite Valley contains the icons that people come to see. Icons like El Capitan, one of the largest monoliths of granite on Earth. Among the world's greatest concentration of granite domes, Half Dome dominates. Although it's actually three quarters of a dome, the celebrated shape can be seen from all sides. And there's no other half. The face of the mountain eroded away bit by bit. While Yellowstone is America's first national park, Yosemite set the stage. Profound beauty and a botanical wonder, the giant sequoias were caused for President Lincoln in the midst of the Civil War to set aside land to be held for public use, resort, and recreation. This was known as the Yosemite Grant and was the first time in not only the history of this country, but the history of the world, that a piece of land was set aside strictly for preservation. Powerful geological forces raised the Sierra Nevada to its present height. During the Ice Age, some three million years ago, glaciers carved the U-shaped canyons. If we look straight across and imagine that there was ice from the rim of the falls all the way almost over to where we are, that's a lot of ice <laughs> and a lot of weight and a lot of power. As this ice was slowly moving through the valley, uh, it just plucked rocks away. Glacier handiwork created Yosemite Falls. At over 2,400 feet, it's the tallest waterfall in North America. Across the valley, Bridal Veil Falls is named for its lacy mist. Powered by snow melt and gravity, peak season for waterfall watching is spring. With over 800 miles of trails, Yosemite is a mecca for day trippers and backpackers. According to Anne Marie Brown, guide and author of 250 great hikes in California's national parks, the best way to get away from the crowds is to head up. It's just a matter of truth that the vast majority of people will stop going as the elevation gets higher and higher. 
Amid the many scenic climbs out of the valley, the Mist Trail is a must do. It's here, Vernal Falls cascades over giant steps carved as glacial ice moved down the valley. The trail, a man-made work of art, runs right along the edge of the spray. The falls drop 317 feet. At its base, sunshine meets mist. Light breaks into the vivid colors of the rainbow, all in a place that looks like Eden. Nevada Falls is yet another perfect union of sky, rock, and water. The mist trail winds relentlessly up. For the super fit with muscles aching for more, it's onward to Half Dome. In 1870, Geologist Josiah D. Whitney declared that Half Dome would probably never be trodden by human foot. But hidden from his view on the eastern side, a rocky buttress provides access. The shortest route, 17 miles round trip, with an elevation gain of 4,800 feet. At the bare minimum, you're going to be on your feet for 78 hours, and then whatever time you spend on top of the dome as well. Um, but the rewards are huge. I mean, it's the outdoor equivalent of running a marathon. A steep set of switchbacks acts like a grand stairmaster. Oh On the shoulder of Half Dome, the climb borders on vertical. Things get more and more intense. All right, here we go until a pair of steel cables becomes a lifeline. He's like, I made it this far, I gotta do it. It's a little hairy. There's just some feeling of having achieved something noteworthy. We're almost there. It's a scramble to the lofty crest. Difficult, but exhilarating and challenging and great fun once you get to the top. I'd add terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Those who make it to the summit say it's like the top of the world. It's fantastic, isn't it? It really is. It's just, it's, it's sort of almost unreal, yeah. actually. There's no place like Yosemite. This legendary landscape is home to over 300 species of wildlife. The Western Rattler, the park's only poisonous snake, ranges in color from yellowish to a smoky shade of black. Visitors rarely see or hear a mountain lion, but this biggest cat in North America is out and about feasting on mule deer. Though encounters are unlikely, the park recommends not to hike alone. Yosemite's most popular mammal is its largest. Called black bears, most are shades of brown. Here, they don't always hibernate. It depends on the elevation. At lower elevations, 2,000 feet, a bear that may not hibernate, whereas at higher elevations it definitely will. But it all comes down to whether it has a food source available to it. Yosemite Valley, the prime tourist destination, is also prime bear habitat. With a nose for food and the steady flow of humans carrying it, bears get into trouble. By 1998, things were out of control. 1,400 car break-ins and $650,000 of property damage caught the attention of Congress. Increased funding allowed the park to focus on the problem. Please, 
probably another bear breaking. At five o'clock in the morning, the bear management team is in the thick. No bear on scene and damage to three vehicles. We, we have more than one bear that breaks into cars, but we have one bear who's really the main culprit. Oh my goodness, look at this car. <laughs> they just pulled in here. Yeah? Probably within the last hour and a half. The bears jumped up on the hood, walked over the top of it, and then came down and pulled the window out. <laughs> good, good. It's not a prints. small bear either, is oh, it? No. Look at that. Bears will break in if they see anything even associated with food. Wow. Well, there's a whole cooler back there. If they continue to frequent developed areas, they're monitored by collars and tags. So I'm just running through the frequencies of bears that this could be if it's a radio collared bear. And we have a list of frequencies. I'm trying to see who's closest. One bear has been spending a lot of time in the more populated parts of the valley. And that makes us feel uncomfortable because she may get too close to people then. We're gonna try and get a collar on her. A bear trap is made more comfortable, then baited with a bag of food at the back. So it goes in and it grabs the bag of food, it pulls it down, and when it's pulled down, it just closes behind it. But we do have one bear who has figured this out and he grabs a bag and sticks his foot out and catches the door. So we have one bigger trap that we always have to catch him in because he has figured this whole system out. One of the tools that we use to make the situation more negative for the bear, the, the conditioning more negative, is we use paintball guns. Um, we had some clear paintball specially designed for us, and they're just full of a kind of a greasy oil that in there. Full. Get out of here, bear! Come on, move! Get out of here! Come on, move! You always want to yell at the same time so that they know a human is doing it, to reinforce that humans are scary. Bears are so intelligent, wildlife experts say they only stay one step ahead of them. We de develop a bear-proof food locker or a dumpster, and eventually they figure it out and we have to come up with another design. In the backcountry, bear-resistant canisters are a must. Hanging food from trees no longer works. The bears caught on to the trick. Knock, knock. Hi. We're just out doing our bear rounds, making sure that all those little brownie bites and Oreo cookies get put away when you get done. Yes. Okay. You are too far from an open lock. Because if it's open and you're not there, you're too far away. To date, the park's tough love policy has paid off. Conflicts have been reduced by 80%. Beyond bears, Yosemite has a rich human history. Native Americans called the valley Awani, meaning place of gaping. Tucked away in a corner, amid tall trees and granite walls, the namesake Awani Hotel is the queen of National Park Lodges. Built on several levels, it's protected and private. The granite ledges and walls of the valley actually seem to just keep extending out into the grounds of the Awani and incorporate the building. It's brilliant, it's artistic, and it's natural, and it feels right to be here in the valley. Celebrated park architect Gilbert Stanley Underwood left nothing to chance. Every detail blends into the beauty of the landscape. The Four Diamond Hotel first opened its doors in 1927. The centerpiece is the Great Lounge with a 24-foot beam ceiling. German Gothic wrought iron chandeliers cast a warm glow over an enormous space. Flanked by two stone fireplaces, there's a lot of detail to absorb. Despite the massive scale, it's warm and inviting, like being a guest 
in a country manner. Views of Yosemite Falls, Half Dome, and Glacier Point bring the outside in. The JFK Suite is named for the president who stayed here in 1962. It has a deck with a private view. Fine dining in the 34-foot trestle beam dining room is a quintessential Yosemite experience. You're coming to a place that's going to cater to, to the special needs of guests and to make your visit very memorable. For many, there's a special connection to the Awani and to Yosemite. While you're enjoying the great outdoors, Take a moment to remember those who came before. The individual eternally linked with Yosemite is naturalist John Muir, who wrote, no temple made with hands can compare with Yosemite. During industrial times, he excited people that a place like this even existed. The United States is a new country. It didn't have the kind of history that Europeans had, had American history, but not an ancient recorded history or history that had large buildings, cathedrals, et cetera. And what became the, the temples for the United States were these wild areas. In 1890, Yosemite was set aside as America's third national park. Two years later, Muir co-founded the famed Sierra Club dedicated to conservation. He described the Sierra as the range of light. Another visionary, America's premier landscape photographer, Ansel Adams, opened the public's eye in a different way. Ansel came to Yosemite for the first time in 1914 and fell in love with it and came back every year of his life. Hiking the backcountry, he became familiar with the ever-changing patterns of light. He definitely caught the moment, the moment, uh, the one second where the light had changed, the one moment where the clouds were covering the valley. That's what Ansel did that no one else could do. Every day around the park, amateurs and professionals are out to get the perfect shot. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you a photograph that Ansel took from this meadow. The Ansel Adams Gallery, a park institution, leads photo walks that follow in Ansel's footsteps. We're going to talk about how to create light and emotion and depth of field. Ansel Adams loved Yosemite. Yet there was one special spot amid the rarefied air of the high country. He took Sierra Club trips in there when he was sort of leading some of the, of the trips for them. And they jokingly said, oh, Ansel, you love this place so much, uh, we should call that mountain up there Mount Ansel Adams. In fact, that became Mount Ansel Adams after he died. And we put his ashes there in 1986 on his mountain. Although Ansel Adams never met John Muir, both men left a legacy of conservation that continues to be an inspiration. Yosemite is the centerpiece of the Sierra Nevada, the longest continuous mountain range in the continental United States. Much of the park lies above 7,500 feet. Called high country, it has a rugged splendor. From Olmstead Point, the back half of Half Dome looms in the distance. Giant boulders left behind by receding glaciers look like the work of extraterrestrials. Amid hundreds of glacial carved lakes, Tanaya is the largest. A lone kayaker cruises by Framed by granite walls and sandy beaches, the water is icy cold. 
the Tuolumne River meanders through the largest subalpine meadow in the High Sierra. We're the gateway to the High Sierras. We're at 8,600 feet above sea level, and there's trails that go up to the elevations over 10, 12,000 feet. Surrounded by high peaks, it's lush, cool, inviting, a meeting place for all. And then there's the crest, which the Tioga Pass Road reaches almost 10,000 feet above sea level. And from there, you can hike up to high elevation peaks that have this magnificent scenery. Tioga Pass is the highest point in the Sierra Nevada that can be crossed by road. The Tioga Pass Resort has been a stop off since 1916. On the park's border, this local hangout is an institution with rustic guest cabins and a general store. Things here never seem to change, and that's a good thing. At the old-fashioned diner, the food's good and the coffee's hot. All right, homemade pie. We have blueberry, apple, and apple pie. It's not the only touch of civilization. For those willing to go the extra mile or miles, the High Sierra Camp System, continuously operating since 1923, is unique in America's national parks. So we have a series of camps, including Tuolumne Meadows, you, there would be six. And you can actually hike to each one of the camps. They're only five to 10 miles apart from each other. So very easily accessible on foot or by a saddle pack trip. A seasonal treat, the camps are only open from mid-June to mid-September, weather permitting. Tuolumne Meadows Lodge, the logical spot to begin a loop trip, has the only tent cabins reachable by road. Uh, one of the questions I get asked most often is, what the heck is a tent cabin? Well, it's basically a raised wooden floor off the ground, just a couple of feet, and then you have canvas siding and a canvas tent on the top and you'd be surprised how well it can keep the weather out and the warmth in, even in really chilly conditions. A stay at the high country cabins is so coveted, reservations are made by lottery. Camp May Lake faces Mount Hoffman. The thing that's really unique about the high camps is that each one has its own topography, own location, very different setting because of the different elevations. In this neck of the woods, people tend to slow down and chill out. Home-cooked meals fuel a hiker's appetite. Among the high country camps, Vogelsang is at the highest altitude. With 1,400 feet of elevation gain, the air thins. Nestled on a mountainside, Vogelsang is a welcoming sight. It's the highest, and uh, it's, it's granite. You know, it's just granite everywhere, and you can see where you're gonna hike, and there's a multitude of peaks to climb. Above the tree line, Vogelsang Pass looks over the vast expanse of the high country. As day turns to night, the mountains light up with alpine glow. Guests begin to grasp what the Yosemite wilderness is all about.
Behind the formation of Yosemite Valley's massive domes and cliffs, eight different types of granite shape the scenery. Flanking the valley, El Capitan, Spanish for the captain, rises over 3,000 feet. It's quite a big rock. When you first drive into the valley, you know, it doesn't fit into your windshield. <laughs> so, you know that's a big rock. While most people are content to gaze up in awe, others go for immediate contact. Clean surfaces, high quality rock, and a gravity defying level of difficulty make Yosemite one of the world's top climbing destinations. From El Cap Meadow, people catch the El Cap Show. It's man and woman versus a monolith. When the route up the nose of El Cap was first climbed in 1958, it opened up mega possibilities for the sport. Goes up those cracks that diagonal up and right into that crescent shaped crack and then you can see people there and then it, you do a little pendulum swing into those cracks that go straight on up. Those are the stove leg cracks and uh, you end up in those upper dihedrals up there Today, over 90 different routes vary in length, but the average ascent takes four days. Only the best opt to free climb it, where partners use ropes and gear strictly for protection. Free climbing El Cap is definitely just as much a mental game as a physical game because there's so much that goes along with it. And you have to deal with being scared, being tired, and just all the logistics of staying on a wall 3,000 feet in the air. In the vertical world, you're on your own. There's no competency test or park permit. Climbing is pretty self-limiting. You make a mistake up there and, and you die. I would say a good percentage of the parties don't make it on their first few tries up El Cap. It's, it's a big deal. The goal is to be successful on the descent and train for the next time. So what we need now is everyone needs a helmet. What we're going to do first is we're going to actually do a little bowling. Since 1969, the Yosemite Mountaineering School and Guide Service has been teaching all levels of rock chocks the art of self-protection. Toes up, heels down, straighten your legs. It's no surprise. They're considered some of the most skilled big wall athletes in the world. It's a push and pull motion here. Look at my left hand, it's never leaving the road. Classes Practice. cover basics and more. You're gonna be moving over to the right, both hands. It's a lot harder than it looks. If you let go, certainly she's gonna fall, okay? But the idea is you're tied in. Go, Matt. Good job. In the 1930s, rope climbing took hold here with techniques brought over from Europe. By the 1940s, routes up the bigger walls were made possible by a Yosemite invention, hammering steel pitons into the rock. Using gear, climbers engineered their way up. The 1960s and 70s were the golden age of climbing, and Yosemite was the epicenter. The sport evolved as athletes sought out ways to excel. Many who chartered Virgin routes began their day at Camp 4, now listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. young guy coming in this place it had a sense of a carnival going on and an athletic event uh, a revolution of some kind every moment breathing walking climbing moment here had a sense of adventure to it more than a place to pitch a tent camp four was a forum for an emerging sport although times have changed the spirit and camaraderie of the pioneering days remains. So if you guys climb Beggar's Buttress in the morning, we climb Moratorium in the morning. 
We can get like a six-man team on Half Dome. Well, it's interesting to see to this day how many people are all around climbing that they still have the passion to make that trip from faraway places to fulfill a dream. So that legacy is still going on. I think one of the really unique things about Camp 4 is that it does not matter what language you speak and that we all have climbing as our common language. In the 1970s, the invention of the modern cam opened up a whole new realm. Clean climbing is done without damaging the rock. Record setter Beth Rodden shows us what separates the good from the best. Yosemite's system rates difficulty on a 5.0 to 5.14 scale. At 5.13, the Phoenix is one tough climb. The Phoenix has a lot of uh, finger locks, which means you stick your fingers in the crack and then you torque them downwards to try and uh, cam them in there so you can then move your body up. And it also has a lot of hand jams where you, you put your hand in and then you hold yourself in there. Crack climbing is fairly unique to Yosemite. Because it's so hard to maintain balance, many new techniques were developed here. There is a whole repertoire of movements that you learn and then you might call on depending on the situation. And, and sometimes it's just the way, yeah, you, you might lean, lean with your shoulder, we call like even a flag movie, you stick your foot out real far so you can extend further. So it has a dance-like gymnastic style movement, which is quite interesting when you're a climber and you look at a rock and think, how will I fit into that? So it's kind of a never-ending opportunity to learn about how to move yourself, how to breathe. For an aerial tour of Yosemite Valley, guaranteed to get your adrenal glands going. On weekends during the summer, a group of men and women in their flying machines gather along Glacier Point. Thirty-two hundred feet above the valley floor, a harness, a hang strap, and a thirty-foot wingspan are all that separate a float from a fall. Pilot hooks in here with his harness. Most pilots fly in a prone position, so they're they're in this attitude flying the glider. And uh, to load up the, a, a right turn, you just move over into the right side of the control frame and the glider starts to create the right turn. To make the glider go up, you simply push the bar away from you. It noses the glider up and you start to climb. To bring the glider down, you just pull in and you start your descent. Putting them together in combinations that create some aerobatic maneuvers make the roller coaster rides look like child's play. Only certified pilots are permitted to take this flying leap. When you plan on flying in Yosemite National Park, you're at your sharpest game. And you have everything pumping in your body, uh, your heart's beating out of your chest, no matter how many times you've done this before. Dice report hang gliding monitor. We have five hang glider pilots ready and rearing to launch. Are we clear for launch? That's yeah, fine, go ahead. We have clearance. Surf's up. All right, guys. Surf's up! You get up in the sky, it's just the kind of euphoria that's, that's hard to describe. You know, we have granite cliffs and the waterfalls that we get to soar over, and we're fortunate enough to see the valley in a way that nobody else gets to see it. Granite cliffs and peaks aren't the only things supersized in these parts. These lands were first set aside to protect a botanical wonder. The Mariposa Grove has the park's biggest stand of giant sequoias. The giant sequoias are the largest living things on Earth in terms of total volume. 
Some trees are taller. Some trees are bigger in diameter. Some trees live to a, a longer age, but the giant sequoia in terms of total volume is the largest. Weighing over two million pounds on average, to grasp the size of a sequoia isn't so simple. Compare it to the Statue of Liberty, a human six feet tall, or the fallen monarch, a tree famous for a photograph of the U.S. Cavalry positioned along its trunk. The California Tunnel Tree was tunneled in 1895 for stagecoach tours. That's right. This is Chase. Do you remember what the tree's name is? No. Remember it was the grizzly giant? The grove's most celebrated tree is the grizzly giant. The most recent study suggests that the grizzly giant is probably close to 1,800 years old, give or take a few years. It's got huge branches, very gnarled. It's lost its top, so it only rises to about 210 feet. It's about 96 feet in circumference and about 30 feet in diameter. I can't see the top. It seems like a very big bird should live <laughs> in such a big tree, doesn't it? <laughs> One of the fastest growing trees on Earth, sequoias require upwards of 1,000 gallons of water a day and plenty of sunshine. Known to live over 3,200 years, the secret to longevity is a sap resistant to fire and decay. The telescope tree is phenomenal. That tree has been gutted by fire, literally struck by lightning at the top, eaten up by fire at the bottom. You can stand in the tree and see the sky. The tree is alive and it's producing cones, it's growing. The Native American word wawona was meant to imitate the hood of an owl, the guardian spirit of the big trees. In a study of the effects of fire on wildlife, U.S. Geological Survey researcher Susan Roberts and her team tread deep into the woods in search of the California spotted owl. To find them, she's mastered their territorial calls. And it goes a little bit like this. And that's more along the tone of the male. And that's the call that they use to say, this is our territory. And they'll have uh, contact calls between the two pairs. And one of them is what's going on behind me, what we call a contact whistle. This bird of prey has evolved into a killing machine with night vision far superior to humans and hearing much more acute. They have what we call asymmetric ear placement. So they have maybe one ear here and one ear a little lower. And the ability to turn their head they can't turn it 360 degrees like a lot of people think, but they can turn it and look behind them. They can focus in on a sound and almost don't even need to see to be able to pinpoint where that mouse is or where the flying squirrel is on the ground. Curved talons are designed to grasp hold of prey. Layers of filaments and feathers filter out the wind, making it a silent flyer. Male and female mate for life. This sensitive species won't nest unless conditions are optimal. The spotted owl isn't listed as endangered, but its reproductive rate is dwindling. According to Susan, national parks are critical to wildlife research. We're just trying to find a little pellet. We have forests the way they were 500, 600 years ago to have it to see what it would look like as a visitor and to have it for science is just beyond precious. The part of the park called Wawona was once the halfway point between Yosemite Valley and the foothills. Today, it's the historical center of the park. Cross a covered bridge and step back in time. A collection of old cabins from various locations is set in a timeline from the 1870s to the 1920s. There's an original ranger's patrol cabin and a jail. When roads were rugged, 
A blacksmith shop was more of a repair shop for wagons and harnesses. At the Wells Fargo building, people once bought stagecoach tickets to the park. The Wawona Hotel, one of California's oldest resort hotels, dates back to the 1870s. The main building and cottages have Victorian-era detail and charm. Inside, the parlor is furnished with period pieces. To harken back to simpler times, wide verandas are for dining, and lawn chairs are for relaxing. The golf course, considered state-of-the-art in 1917, is still a challenge. While you're perfecting your swing, keep an eye out for coyotes. For an unexpected retreat into old world elegance, Outside the park's Wawona entrance, the Chateau du Serreau means castle by the elderberries. This five diamond member of the prestigious Relais and Chateau organization is a dream destination. With only 12 rooms, a stay here is all about privacy and hospitality. The great manor houses of Europe in the old days, when, when there was the affluent, they invited their friends over. It was all about, they knew they were going to be taken care of. They had this beautiful bedroom, and uh, there was a staff assigned to them, and they just were spoiled. It's a different kind of stay. At Erna's Elderberry House restaurant, artful dishes are always evolving. I believe food parallels all other art forms and when you dive into photography or, or get into um, the waterfalls out here, it shows in the plate also. I think we have a pretty beautiful product. The dining room with chandeliers and impeccable tablescapes is yet another idyllic setting. Beauty makes your soul feel good, you know. It, it's important that we still remember how it used to be and that it does feel good. Yosemite's Merced River originates in the snow fields of the High Sierra, then descends over 12,000 feet. Explorers who came upon it after traveling through bone-dry terrain called it the River of Mercy. A float through the park makes for effortless sightseeing. In the spring, outside the park's western boundary, the Merced becomes mighty with class three and four rapids. Frigid temperatures and swift currents make it one exhilarating ride. One of the most scenic stretches of Wild River in the world the Merced mirrors the lush and serene Yosemite Valley. Once upon a time, there was a sister valley called Hetch Hetchy, a Native American word for meadow grass. This treasure now lies under a reservoir eight miles long, the park's biggest body of water. So we're standing here looking at a reservoir, which you have to remember would never be built today. I mean, this is something that 100 years ago, people had a real different notion of national parks. Even then, the dam was controversial. The saga began in 1906. In the aftermath of a great quake, San Francisco burned to the ground.
And so when some of the architects and engineers from the city of San Francisco came here to Yosemite, they saw the mouth of the Tuolumne River and the Hetch Hetchy Valley, and they had the idea to build a dam. The proposed dam set the stage for John Muir's most bitter battle and a national debate. He thought that this was a cathedral and to build a dam and fill up this water um, was basically like taking a cathedral and filling it with water and it was desecration in its highest form. In the end, progress and sympathy for San Francisco won out. Building the O'Shaughnessy Dam was a feat of logistics. Hetch Hetchy was an extremely remote area. A railroad hauled men and materials up mountainous terrain. They constructed walls 430 feet high and 298 feet thick. Today, the dam supplies electricity and water to 2.4 million Bay Area users. Residents of San Francisco enjoy some of the cleanest, purest water there is. With no pumps, the system relies entirely on gravity. John Muir never lived to see any of it, but people claim they see his face in the reservoir's north wall. Hetch Hetchy may be a 21st century marvel. Deconstruction of the dam and restoration of the valley is being studied. The O'Shaughnessy Dam was done by humans and it can be undone by humans. And in our plan for restoring the Hetch Hetchy Valley, it can take about five years to deconstruct the dam. And the scientists tell us the Hetch Hetchy Valley will restore itself on its own. For John Muir, going to the mountains was going home. To represent the state of California on the U.S. quarter, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger chose images of Muir, the Condor, and Half Dome. Amid the grandeur of the Sierra Nevada, the 211-mile John Muir Trail winds through parklands to wilderness lands. It's here Muir co-founded the Sierra Club to, in his words, do something for the wilderness and make the mountains glad. From Glacier Point, it is a glorious sight. Yosemite today is a haven for black bears and big trees, rock jocks, scientists, and visitors and way beyond. It's the birthplace of a conservation movement heard round the world.